safety factor here far outweighs the concern about uh, shutting people out or creating a barrier. That was Karen Freeman Wilson, president of the Chicago Urban League, speaking on Chicago-based WTTW News, dispelling any notion that COVID vaccine-related employer mandates would shut out black and brown communities. That comment was the subject of independent journalist Lee Fong's recent Substack piece examining how pharmaceutical giant Pfizer was behind funding groups like the Chicago Urban League heavily lobbying for COVID vaccine mandates. He found that Pfizer gave $100,000 to the organization which is not the only organization Pfizer gave cash to. Now, here to discuss the expansive financial effort to Pfizer went to in supporting groups like the Chicago Urban League is author of that piece, Lee Fong. Great to see you, Lee. Hey, Robbie. Thanks for having me. Yeah. How are yeah, you? Tell, we're doing uh, just fine. <laughs> Exciting week it's been. Uh, tell us more about your reporting and, and what you've found here. We're very interested in efforts that you know all sorts of individuals and organizations made, but particularly Pfizer itself, to promote the vaccine. Yeah, so this piece looks at exclusive documents um, that detail Pfizer's donations to outside third-party organizations and really looking at their role in lobbying for policies that compelled people to take uh, the COVID vaccine. You know, in 2021, there were a number of city, state, and uh, the federal government's COVID vaccine mandate, um, com really compelling and coercing people to take the vaccine. There were not exemptions for prior infection or natural immunity. Um, this was a very controversial policy. And part of the lobbying effort to build public support and policymaker support uh, for this COVID vaccine mandate uh, was the role of these community groups, uh, civil rights groups, uh, medical societies, public health organizations. Um, a lot of these groups were very visible in pushing for the mandate. And like the Urban League was one of them, they did not disclose that they were funded at the time by Pfizer. And, you know, I was looking at some of these specialized grants. They were funded uh, in particular to promote uh, immunizations, promote the vaccine, to kind of dispel myths about the vaccine, uh, to engage in legislative strategy um, you know, related to Pfizer. So, you know, this is kind of a, a long time strategy of big pharma. Drug companies have um, been under the rate, been under scrutiny for their role in funding third party groups that kind of create the appearance of public support uh, for their products. But this is kind of an extreme example because, you know, this is the most lucrative uh, pharmaceutical product perhaps in human history. This is a very controversial policy opposed by many civil libertarians, labor groups, and others. Um, but the role of Pfizer funding this outside support for the mandate hasn't been disclosed until now. Yeah, this is such an interesting one because earlier in the pandemic, there was this sensitivity to the idea that black Americans in particular have had a complicated relationship with the you know, medical uh, industry because of instances like the Tuskegee experiment, being experimented on, injected with a disease, not being told, et cetera. And that the way, the posture that the government took toward encouraging people to make use of a vaccine, which did dramatically lower hospitalization rates, especially in those early days before people had had um, any kind of booster or protection at all, uh, was to not browbeat black people or not to kind of smear them the way that I think that some more conservative leaning people who objected to the vaccine were smeared, but to be sensitive to those concerns and to uh, ally them by talking about safety and all of those other kinds of things. That shifted at a certain point. Um, and th there was much more of a cudgel that was used or an implication that, um, you know, talking about the disparities uh, in vaccines between black people and other people was seen as politically inconvenient. Because what, you know, if we're saying that anti vax or non-vaxxers are bad Republican racists, what do you do with this black population who's also expressing some concerns about vaccine hesitancy? So, so having a group particularly a, a, a black oriented group receive funding does does help to paper over some of those tensions. And I, I also am, am concerned about it because so many 
I would say black groups are disproportionately underfunded, have fundraising concerns. We see this with black electeds, that they tend to come from poorer districts, have a tougher time earning money, and do tend to be more susceptible for those reasons to taking money from various corporations. When there is at time a difference of interest between the people who are giving the money and the groups that they are supposed to serve. And I wonder if you've seen anything about whether or not there were any concerns about black black people in Chicago potentially losing their jobs, having economic consequences as a result of not wanting to not wanting to take the vaccine and being subject to an actual mandate. No, we, you know, we know that the mandates uh, created the firing of thousands of workers ac across the country. I don't know if we have a racial breakdown, but we do know that, you know, in municipalities like New York City and, and D.C., and San Francisco and others, um, there was uh, kind of a, a racial disparity in, in terms of who was taking uh, the, the vaccine, who was not kind of abiding by these mandates. Uh, there was kind of a disproportionate effect. But, you know, you're, you're right. There, there was kind of early early in the pandemic, there was a concern and I think a very nuanced discussion about, you know, what are the legitimate fears and, and concerns around the vaccine? How do, what's the most kind of effective way to talk about these issues and, and to persuade? But by 2021, on uh, summer of 2021, uh, like a lot of the, the COVID discourse, it was very polarized, you know, just like how in the media, uh, any kind of discussion around the origins of COVID became very polarized. You know, if you had kind of any suspicions about a lab leak, um, you were condemned as you know, a bigot or, you know, a Trumper, um, you know, concerns around vaccine mandates uh, similarly became polarized. You know, it, it, you, you were condemned as a, a racist or, you know, an extremist or an anti-vaxxer. Um, you know, there are many benefits to the vaccine. You know, now that we see um, we, there's a lot of research and studies showing that uh, the Pfizer vaccine and others reduce kind of the severeness, especially in elderly, uh, more kind of uh, vulnerable populations. Um, there's, there's great benefits to that. But rather than having kind of a detailed discussion based on the scientific research, it became kind of, a um, again, a polarized discussion of, you know, you're either with us or against us. Um, not looking at the research showing that, look, um, a lot of the, the claims around um, when pr from proponents selling the vaccine saying, you know, this will end the pandemic. Once you take the vaccine, uh, you know, there's no chance of transmission. You can't get COVID. That was wrong. That was not supported by the evidence. That those those claims um, by uh, uh, the administration and others um, w were disputed at the time, and now you know years out, it looks clearly false. Um, but you know we're in a moment of, of of kind of hysteria around these issues, and you couldn't have a sober discussion. Yeah, that is the crux of this matter. That. The people pushing the va not just the vaccine, but but being open to policies actually requiring it in the various places it was required. It was required for many workers. It was required for some schools. It still to this day is required the bivalent booster on some college campuses. When they go back in the fall, they'll have to take it. And the, the justification was a public health benefit, not for yourself, but you have to take this because this is going to drive down cases in the long run. The people making that the public health establishment that government health scientists and advisors and Pfizer itself, its boosters and, and and the media and, you know, everyone pressuring tech companies to to toe that line on social media. Like you said, that all ended up being wrong. And I don't know if there's there's going to be any reckoning. You know, Dr. Fauci, there was an article he was interviewed uh, in The New York Times yesterday. We talked about it. And he, he's asked some pretty pointed questions about that, about her about her immunity, about all sorts of things. And, uh, and I saw, I sensed very little a accountability from him uh, personally. You know, you've been on kind of the looking at the, the, the Pfizer side of things. Can, can you sense any reckoning within the company itself uh, on, how, on how this vaccine was, was not necessarily sold under false pretenses, but certainly the, the necessity of requiring it was, was pushed under, under premises that turned out to be wrong? Well, there are a couple of things here. You know, when you're a big corporation, an oil company, a bank or a big tech company, you know, the public uh, is suspicious for a very good reason. You know, you're, you're, these corporations exist to make profit, uh, not to serve the public interest. And so to build public support for their lobbying strategies, for their other kind of goals in society, they often use this playbook of funding outside groups with much more credibility, like here with, with Pfizer funding civil rights organizations and public health organizations. 
uh, medical societies. And, you know, uh, in Congress, we're now seeing a, a lot of interesting questions being raised about the role of these um, COVID policies. Were they based on sound scientific and medical evidence? The problem here, I think, is tension around money and politics. Um, Republicans in Congress are, are, are quick to kind of investigate um, the CDC and other public health agencies, but they're a little bit more reluctant so far in investigating uh, big corporate interests. You know, they, they haven't really subpoenaed uh, the big biopharma uh, lobbying groups uh, like bio and pharma. Um, that I, you know, I don't, I haven't seen the kind of um, strident investigations of Pfizer itself. Um, I think there's a great opportunity to really understand um, the way that these policies were crafted, the role of large pharma corporations in shaping the public debate, shaping these regulatory policies, shaking, shaping even just the discourse by funding these groups that were very visible in the media um, back in 2021, 2022. Um, I think that's TBD. It's, it's, it's yet to be determined. Yeah, I'm so glad that you're on that beat, Lee. Thank you for always following the money so assiduously. I look forward to seeing your future reporting on this subject. Thanks for having me. More rising after this.